I'm Brett from Heinemann, and today on the podcast, we're examining the relationship between photography and writing. Ralph Fletcher, most recently the author of Focus Lesson, believes that the language of writing has a natural link with photography. He writes that photography can illuminate the craft of writing and help us understand it in a whole new way. In this episode, Heinemann author Carl Anderson sits down with Ralph to discuss focus lessons and how educators might start to regard the camera as an integral part of the writing classroom. So hi, Ralph. How are you? I'm doing fine. Very, very excited to be talking to you today about your new book, Focus Lessons. And I, I've been a fan of your work for 25 years now. It's an amazing thing. And, you know, I first encountered your work with your book, What a Writer Needs, uh, which I think is one of the foundational books on the teaching of craft. And I read that in 1994. And I, I remember coming to a Heinemann workshop in the Chicago area where I was teaching, where I met you for the first time. And I still have the signed book. And that book was uh, followed by so many other books that have been so influential in my thinking and other people's thinking, like your craft lessons books that you did with Joanne Portalupi, your colleague and wife. Uh, one of my all-time favorites, Boy Writers, which there's not a day that goes by in my work with teachers that I don't mention that book. And recently, your book, Joyrite, is just an amazing contribution, you know, bringing joy and playfulness back into the writing workshop. And uh, so you've had so many wonderful professional books. And of course, there's so many other books <laughs> that are so important that you've done. As you know, I, I'm such a fan of your memoir, Marshfield Dreams, and your, your recent memoir, Marshfield Memories, the sequel. And um, I talk about those all over the world. Of course, there's your books of poetry and your books of fiction for children, uh, Fig Pudding, which is known far and wide, and uh, of course, uh, Spider Boy. And uh, so you just have all these amazing books, and you've had such an impact on me. And Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I just want to say that really means a lot coming from you, and I, I really appreciate you all your, your kind words. Thank you. Yeah, well, there are just so many of us that are Ralph Fletcher fans all over the world, and we just so appreciate your work. But now you have this brand new book called Focus Lessons, uh, How Photography Enhances the Teaching of Writing. And I had the special privilege of getting to read a preview copy of it a couple of weeks ago. And the book just, in, it, it just entranced me. It just blew me away. And I just think it's a really important contribution to our field. So I'm just really excited about the chance to talk to you about it today. And I have a bunch of questions that I've, that I, that I want to ask you. Let's start with this one. Ralph, early in the book, you write, this book is rooted in my journey into photography, which has been an intensely personal one. I'd like you to describe this journey for us to kind of give us the context for this book. I think that when you and I were speaking recently, you mentioned that it, you could see that it's become a priority for me. And uh, that is really true. You know, you can't fake that urge to do something, whether it's to paint or to write or whatever it is. And it's something that drew me kind of like came out of the blue. I became really... Um, excited about taking pictures. And I will say that it was a, a stub your toe journey <laughs> all the way. I mean, I had lots of mishaps, you know, buying the wrong equipment and umpteen blurry pictures or overexposed. And it hasn't always been um, a smooth journey, but it has been something that has been um, meaningful to me. And I think also, you know, because I've had some success in writing and, you know, you alluded to some of the books that I've written, I felt that I didn't need to um, push and try to sell all, all these photos. You know, it's sort of something that I can do out of just pure love and enjoyment. Basically, without getting into too much detail, the process has been, I, I seem to uh, learn best by actually hanging out with people who are really skilled at whatever it is I'm trying to learn. So I've gone on a number of uh, trips with other professional photographers who have kind of imparted their, their knowledge and had a chance to work with them shoulder, uh, next to shoulder. And, and so that's really what's happened. And, you know, I, I just want to say, um, you know, I just know I have a long way to go. <laughs> you know, there's no there there. But I do think that there's something about in any field, if you can get a certain amount of competence, you can get to the point you can enjoy doing it. And I feel like kind of at that point now where I, I really enjoy doing it. And we enjoy the work you've done too, Ralph. You've been just so generous in sharing a lot of your photos on social media and Facebook and Twitter. And uh, you have quite a following and people that just love your photos and the view, uh, your view of the world that you see through your eyes that you've, you've shared with us, I think has been a real gift for so many people. Well, thank you. Uh, and you know, I, I think I've always been really interested, um, in the natural world, you know, and um, going way, way, way back to when I was a little boy, you know, when we lived in Marshfield, my mom would take us out for a walk. Us, you know, we'd, she'd talk about signs of spring in, in March and we'd look for like little aspects of a uh, little bit of green here and there. And I think those are some of the early roots of it. 
being a chance to like do a lot of camping as a scout. So it's, I think that photography has allowed me to really delve into that love of nature. That's great. How funny it is that Joanne gave you a camera as a present some years ago and, you know, kind of surprised you. And it's just taken you onto this incredible journey as a photographer um, that you share it in the book so nicely. So, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, as, as I got into the book, it was interesting for me to hear you talk about how as you immerse yourself into photography, you were surprised to find yourself making a lot of connections to writing. I'm curious about what some of those connections are. Well, it was really um, uncanny in a way to be working with all these photographers who had a lot of expertise and a lot, lot of knowledge. And when they would start talking about the process, they would use a language that was very familiar to writing. They talk about angle, they talk about point of view and detail and tension. And many, many times I would say to myself, my goodness, they could be talking about writing. So I, I think that's one thing. First of all, there's a, there's a real common language between the two. And the other thing is that it's clear to me that both writing and photography are a way of composing. And I think it's important to remember that the word photography means literally writing with light. I mean, it's it's something, I, again, it's like something I never really thought of myself. Um, but I, I think that there's a lot of overlap. It sounds really funny, but I would say that in many cases, by learning more about photography, I think I began to understand some stuff about writing that I never understood before, or at least understand it in a deeper way. There's some just kind of broad lessons about writing too. I think Artie Morris was one of your photography teachers, right? Yes. And he said, you know, it's interesting, you quoted him and said that he said to you, a lot of photography depends on just showing up. And that's so true in writing also. Yeah. And I would say that uh, we have this, we have this joke in my family that like, you know, I used to always say that I'm a morning person and, and my wife would say, you, you want to be a morning person, but you're not one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but now I really am. I get up early because that's when the best light is. And, you know, it, it might mean that you're at a certain spot, a beautiful spot in nature, but you may go five days in a row and not see that much. But then there's that one day or you'll be surprised at what you see. So, yeah, I think that showing up is important and you'll show up if it really is meaningful to you and it grabs you, I mean, as a writer or as a photographer or whatever, like investing that time. I mean, you know, Malcolm Gladwell famously talked about the 10,000 hours, but I mean, that seems kind of arbitrary, but there's no doubt that if you're going to be good at something, you need to um, invest the time at it. And, you know, when you say invest the time, it sounds like you're sort of digging a ditch. I just want to say that, like, for me, investing the time has been really um, a pleasurable thing. I, I mean, I do it because I enjoy it. Yep. And you, you connect, um, I think what Artie said, uh, Artie Morris said to what Don Murray said, I think, when he said to write early and write fast. And, and that's yeah. what you're doing with your camera when you get up really early and you're perched by a riverbank taking pictures. Yeah. And I think that um, sometimes there's no doubt that things are happening all the time in the world. But I think that to try to be the kind of person who pays attention to it. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that one of the things about taking pictures is really it's honed my powers of observation. I don't know if you saw the picture that I posted. I just found this little monarch butterfly chrysalis. Mm -hmm, and um, mm -hmm. it was just so amazing to see it. And I was just looking for it. And there, I mean, I was just looking to see if, and I looked closer. I'd never seen one before. And mm -hmm. then when I looked closely, I could see the outline of the, the monarch. I think that um, it's kind of helped me to pay more attention to the world around me. Yeah, uh, we had a monarch butterfly. We had many in our garden this um, this summer, but um, there was one out one day and I just followed around with my cell phone. I mean, I'm not a photographer like you are, but I just wanted to capture this, just this, this fleeting beauty of this amazing creature just, you know, flitting from flower to flower. Yeah, I haven't seen the, the chrysalis photo yet, but I'll be looking for it. So um, one of the biggest ahas I had when I was, was reading the book was this discussion, this amazing discussion that you had of how we can use digital cameras usually embedded in our cell phones as a kind of writer's notebook or a photo book, as you called it. I'd love for you to explain some of your thinking about this. Yes, I think it's an interesting concept. And it's one of these ideas that I haven't fully cracked open yet. But I think right, it's almost right. like, a, a, and I, I think I'm sort of describing something that's actually happening rather than sort of suggesting something that could happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I really think that, you know, um, many people and not just children too, I think that the teachers I've talked to have said that they also find themselves using their cell phone cameras as writer's notebooks. When I say a writer's notebook, I think of it as kind of like a, a collection point. You know, our, our friend Artie Voigt talks about a writer's notebook should be a high comfort, low risk place. And I think that for many people, their cell phones are something that they feel very comfortable with. It's an, almost an extension of who they are. 
And so when something happens, the most natural thing is to react by pulling out the camera and, and, you know, pulling out the cell phone and then taking a picture. So I think that people are using it in that way, collecting, reacting, savoring the important stuff, but also kind of just the odd or peculiar or weird things about life that we just want to remember. We want to just preserve them because they somehow say something about our life. <laughs> so um, I think that it's something that I see myself doing, and it turns out that I think a lot of kids are doing also. So it's kind of making me think about the Redis notebook in a kind of a new way. You know, it's not exactly like taking up a notebook and open it up and with a pen. It's more kind of reacting digitally to the world and visually to the world. Right, right. So much of my son's life is digital now. He constantly takes pictures and shares them on Instagram. I think his whole life goes up there, whether it's you know, waking up in the morning or being at the climate march on Friday, it's all there. As I was reading your book, it just struck me, you know, of course, cell phones in school or, you know, there's, we just signed five or six contracts. He's in 10th grade and all of them like, if you bring a cell phone into, into my class, terrible things will happen to you. And of course we don't want kids, you know, on, you know, surfing the web or texting their friends during a class. But on the other hand, it's this, in, you know, this incredible repository of the kids' lives are contained on those cell phones. And, um, you know, just there's so many ways to bring that into a, into a writing workshop. And I thought you did such a wonderful job thinking about that. Yeah, and I think that um, some of the questions about how to bring in the problems that teachers might run into in this re in this regard, I think th that some of this material is, uh, or some of these questions are are evolving, is what I'm trying to say. You know, I think that, like you say, some schools, I would say probably most schools or many schools, um, don't allow kids to have their phones in school for, for good reason. But there's often, um, you know, there's iPads that are available. I think there's a lot of accessible camera material for kids to use in, in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of the work that Troy Hicks and his colleagues have done with digital technology, with cell phones and in, in classrooms that when I've heard him speak at NCTE and just thinking of your work alongside uh, some of that. So it's powerful stuff to think about. There's a, a huge part of your book. I think, you know, one of the most wonderful parts of the book to me is you detail this incredible series of craft lessons for writers. And you suggest that we can begin these lessons with discussing an aspect of photography as a powerful way of introducing the writing craft lessons. And you know, I'm just curious how you see teachers using these lessons in the writing workshop. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's, I'm really struck by the idea that the craft of photography and the craft of writing are two roads that run parallel to each other. They really do. And um, I think that teachers who are trying to explain elements of writing to kids or craft moves that writers make can use the visual world of photography to make those things come, come alive. Many people have been doing this to some extent in the past. I mean, I've heard Barry Lane talk about zooming in or zooming out. Yep, yep, um, yep. So it's not, like, it's not like I invented this idea. But I think that we can really look at the world of photography and the craft that's involved. That can be a, a way to explain the craft of writing. You know, a lot of the words that we use um, in terms of the craft of writing, I think that they're kind of vague, they're amorphous, and they're mm -hmm, hard for mm -hmm. kids to grab onto. You know, we talk about tone or voice. Yep, yep. And, and I think that the world of photography may give us a more tangible language. And I think it's a language that kids are familiar with because they're taking pictures and they're thinking about these things themselves all the time. And I, it's interesting how the lang like the titles for your lessons, the terminologies, it so much draws upon photography. Like one of your lessons is beware of the pretty picture. Another is consider the point of view. Uh, another is play with foreground and background. Yeah, and I think that um, writing is not magical. You know, you can get there from here. And I think that requires understanding some of the ways that language goes together to make to make sentences that work. And I think that the same thing is true with taking pictures, that it's not just like taking a snap and just getting a great picture. You've got to consider a lot of decisions. You know, I always say to kids that writers are decision makers. Right, You're making right. De decisions all the time, and I think that's true in, in taking pictures. And I think if you really get kids to reflect, they're making decisions all the time when they're taking those pictures. Do I want to get in close? Do I want to get back? Do I want to like angle it this way? Who's going to be in the picture? Kids are thinking about this stuff. They may not be aware that they're thinking about it, but they are thinking about it. Yeah. And, you know, you, you start the book with, you know, the, this whole bit about being making decisions. You tell that story very early in the book about how people respond to you and they see you taking pictures like, wow, what kind of camera is making those pictures? And you're clear to say, 
<laughs> my eyes are taking these pictures. The camera's just helping me, a tool to help me make decisions. Just like my laptop doesn't write stories, I have to make lots of decisions as a writer. I thought that's a great story and a great way of beginning the book. You know, it was interesting as I was reading through the lessons, I was making a lot of connections to Marshfield Dreams. Because as you know, and as many teachers know, I use uh, stories from Marshfield Dreams extensively in writing workshops with kids. And I, you know, there's two lessons that you have, zoom in close and take a wide perspective. And immediately I thought if we zoom in close, your story statue about when you were three or four years old, and it's this beautiful, small momenty kind of story about you pretending you're a statue outside on the weekend morning and your parents coming outside and quote unquote, buying you and you turn into a real boy. It's a beautiful, beautiful example of zooming in close. And, and then I thought in the same, also in that collection of stories, taking a wide perspective, well, there's Scuttlebutt, your story Scuttlebutt, which takes place over the course of a whole year or more, where that little girl in your class kept telling you that your mom was expecting a baby before you knew it. And that, that story takes a wide perspective of a lot of time. So I was immediately connecting some of these lessons to you know, mentor texts that, um, you know, stories that you've written. That interplay between photography and writing, I, I just kept going through my mind as I was reading through the lessons. Yeah, and I think that it's going to be interesting to see um, some teachers, you know, want to use all the lessons. Um, another teacher who's maybe uh, has a more uh, preset writing curriculum, I think you still could salt in some of these lessons to change it up a little bit. I think the good teachers are always taking that reflective stance. So you try something and you step back to see if it works or not. You know, I was thinking also, um, Carl, about the fact that, you know, when you teach writing, you know, a lot of us, when we teach writing, what we really do is we sort of go into a parallel world in a world of literature, right? We sort of say, okay, let's look at literature and let's see what these writers do. It's still textual, but it's kind of a different world. And then we sort of, we look at what the writers are doing and then we actually, then we go back to the writing and say, you guys could try this in your own writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In some ways, I think I'm doing the same thing as I'm saying, let's look at the world of photography. What are these photographers doing? How are they doing it? And then identifying a craft move and then segueing back into the kids' writing and suggesting that they might want to experiment with it themselves when they write. Right. I think each of the lessons, you know, when you talk about photography at the beginning, they're wonderful metaphors. I mean, I've occasionally used camera metaphors in conferences. You know, if I'm teaching focus, I might say, I, I pretend to hold my, like a camera and I say, I could zoom into your nose or I could step back and take a picture of the whole class. And that's a choice we make in a story. But you take that so much further in this book. And I, I just think the lessons are a real gift to everyone. You know, I had a kind of Bob Dylan thought as I was reading through them, because, you know, there's some artists like Paul McCartney that basically play their songs for 30 years exactly the way it was in the album. But Bob just keeps reinterpreting his songs and I think often making them better when he plays them in concert. And, you know, in some of the lessons in this book, you know, I, you have earlier versions of them and what a writer needs and they're wonderful. And here you're just kind of doing what Bob Dylan does. You're saying, let me see if I can reimagine these in more powerful ways by using photography as a metaphor. So I, I just was completely taken by these lessons and just, um, just really happy that you put them together like this for us in a way that I think kids are, especially as you say, because they take pictures all the time. Ralph, I, I, did you have a camera as a kid? Uh, yeah, I probably had a brownie or something. Yeah. <laughs> I had a little Kodak Instamatic. F film right. was expensive. I might have taken 10 or 15 pictures a year. And, uh, and kids today are taking photos constantly. So you're right. They are immersed in photography. And I think they're going to have an understanding from these metaphors that very different than perhaps you and I would have had as children, simply because kids today take so many pictures and it's such a part of their lives. Well, one thing I was going to say, um, Carl, about that is that, you know, you and I work with teachers. And so I think that it's fair to say, I'm going to generalize, but teachers tend to be text people. In other words, like we focus on words, and metaphors and language. And so it's possible that maybe even I'll speak for myself. Um, at times I've been almost uh, resistant to the visual world of imagery. and But I just want to say that I've been kind of heartened by the fact that the teachers, the initial response to this book from teachers that I've talked to about it has been curiosity. You know, it may require a, a shift of thinking for a lot of us who have been kind of all in and for words and, and text to sort of say, not, not just sort of to throw that stuff out. I mean, I'm always going to care about language. I mean, I just will. But I think that also bringing in some of the visuals in the uh, photographic images is a way to kind of enhance or, you know, strengthen what we're trying to do with kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I agree. A couple other things I wanted to ask you, 
after the craft lessons, you uh, write a couple chapters, and I, what you say is that photography is in and of itself important to discuss with children. You talked about teaching visual literacy, and you also talked about this really interesting phrase, I thought, photographing to learn. I found that really thought-provoking, and I was wondering if you could talk about those uh, a little bit and kind of give us a, a little feel for what, you're, what else you were talking about in the book. Well, first of all, I, I always feel a little bit humble when I, you know, when we mention visual literacy, because there are people who have been, you know, this is their field, they've been writing about it and thinking about it for many years. So I don't purport to be some sort of a super expert on, on that field. But I would say that I think that as the world becomes more visual, we want to help kids become better and more savvy consumers of the images that come in all the time. And so partly that's just to make them alive to the world, but also at the same time, we want kids to be able to be more thoughtful about the kind of uh, pictures that they take and see what's going on. So that, you know, it's like, and just like when we look at a poem with kids, we can help listen to what they have to say, but also we can point out some of the things that the writer's doing. And, you know, thinking of the poem as a, as a mentor text, I think that photos can, off, uh, can also be mentor text. So I think that teachers can also look at some of these images and help the kids become um, aware of some of the decisions that go into it. And then the other thing is that, um, in terms of writing, you know, I think I think I talk about the fact that people used to think of writing as just a way to regurgitate what you already know. And then there were people like James Moffat and Don Murray and, and others who said, no, 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 writing is really a investigative tool. You really discover what you have to say in the act of writing it. And I really think there's a strong and a striking parallel there with photography because I have found that by taking pictures, I have learned so much about the, the world. And I could give you like, many examples of that and show you like where I thought something and then I took a picture and then I looked closely at the picture and I had to revise my understanding about the world. I said, oh, that's what I thought was happening was not what, what was happening. And I think it's a, a bunch of things there. It's first of all, it's the observation that goes on because I'm actually paying very close attention right before the picture gets taken. So I'm kind of zoom, I'm really focused in then taking the picture itself, but then also really later on when I go back and re- vision and really take a good look at the images, often that's time that's the time when I make some discoveries. It's oftentimes not the discovery when I actually take the picture. It's later looking at the image yeah. when I real I realized that what I thought was happening was not exactly what was happening. Yeah. The one about the um I don't remember the name of the bird, but um the uh Phoebe. Yes. The one that <laughs> yeah. was uh hitchhiking on her mom's back. Oh yeah, that was the uh the Merganza. Yes. Yeah. And it's um I think this is happening in many fields, by the way. You know, there are many fields that have been revolutionized by photography. So I think that one of the things that to think about in the classroom is that when we get kids taking their own pictures, we want to really give them time to really look back, take a close look at what they've taken and see if they make any discoveries. I think that's important too. It's not just a matter of you taking the picture and then you've got it. No, you have to go back and look at it and you've got to really um, look closely. Yeah. I think one of the implications of your book too is... Um how are you thinking the teachers could help students with digital cameras or photography in the classroom? And you know, are you anticipating any obstacles they might be facing? I think that there's going to be, you know, a lot of steps forward and steps back. I think that sometimes we may feel to get our feet wet that we'll want to give the kids a little, um, you know, an assignment or a prompt. Teachers have had some good luck with sending the kids out in the playground with simple cameras and ask them to take pictures of the alphabet. Look for an A, look for a B, look for a C. And that's a good way to get the kids to be alive to what's right around them. And they're, they're looking closely. And, um, you know, with older kids, there's a woman that I talk about in the book, Joan McCary. She has got this, this self-E project where she actually gets the kids taking pictures of themselves and also reflecting on what it says about them, what aspects of their personalities revealed in the pictures. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that sometimes we will want to structure their uh, activities a little bit and not make it too open-ended. But I also think that we can try to ask the kids, you know, find out what they're interested in. And, you know, I make the point in the book that as much as we will want to show the kids images from either famous photographers, important photographers, contemporary artists, you know, people right now that are taking pictures, those are all important. But I also think it's really important that we make time and space for students to be taking their own pictures. That's an important step. You know, it may raise some issues. I know that sometimes whenever anybody talks about taking pictures, there's all kinds of permissions that have to be done. And, you know, I understand there's some things that have to be worked through, but I think that the kids will be 
invested in the pictures that they're taking themselves in a way that would be just different than when you look at a picture from Angela Adams or, you know, someone like that, even if he's famous or she's famous. Yep, I agree. There's something a lot of teachers do when they launch writers' notebooks at the beginning of the year. They ask the kid, they take the kids outside and go on a walk. I guess they call them observation walks. And the idea is that you go around and notice things and then write them about their notebook. And just thinking about how if the kids had cameras and that kind of adventure, just how that would enhance that kind of exercise, um, being wide awake to the world. It's fascinating. Didn't Don Graves say that, you know, uh, poetry puts us in a constant state of, uh, of composing, constantly yep. composing? Yep. And I, and I think that once you start taking pictures, well, and kids are already taking pictures, they are composing all the time. You know, yep. they are composing all the time. It's, <laughs> they literally for- compose all the time. Watch my son. It's hysterical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating to watch this shift, you know, in their lives. One thing that I, I, I have to say that um, you had some advice in the book not to force the connection between photography and writing, and which got me thinking about a story that you tell in one of your books about a classroom you're in and it was snowing out and the kids were whispering to each other, don't tell her, she'll make us write about them. And there is a way that you don't want photography to become that next snowfall that the kids feel obligated to write about. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about the ways that you think writing could be sparked by photography and, and how it could be used as an invitation for kids to write, not a mandate. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, I post pictures on Instagram and I'm often struck by when people make a comment, they'll say to me, great picture and great caption. You know, like the caption is part of it. It's not just sort of this throwaway. The caption or the first sentence or the the title, it angles the picture. It gives the reader a way into it. So I think we're going to be looking at a lot of short text that are accompanying photos. And I know that in the chapter I wrote about, for example, a a simple example of that is the meme, right? Mm -hmm, With a mm -hmm. photograph and there's like one sentence or just a little couple of words that make a cryptic comment about the photo or use the photo to make a comment about life or something. I think that, you know, as much as possible, we need to kind of create a space where we kind of invite kids to do it, but we also try to be a little bit patient, let the kids find their own way. You know, I'll just give you a quick example, Carl. You know, I I just came back from this trip to Africa, as you know, and I took all these pictures of these elephants. And, um, and, you know, looking at these pictures, I really want to write a picture book that's based on it. So I guess I would say the experience inspired me, but also the images themselves inspired me. But it's taken, it didn't happen right away. You know what I mean? It took a while for me to look at them and to put them together and say, gee, I do have a sort of a story here, these elephants coming into the water hole and at a certain time of the day. So, you know, it's, it's that dance that teachers do. So there are times when we do nudge, but there's times we let kids discover themselves. And, and I think in my chapter, I also made the example of like, I had this one picture where I, I wrote a poem about it, but I think that in some ways the poem was almost superfluous. It sometimes, sometimes like you can over explain something too. And when you over explain it, you take the mystery and the magic out of the image. Which is really, that, that's ex- you know, the exact thing that you don't want to do when you take a picture, right? I mean, yes, as teachers, we want kids to be writing. If they're also just explaining what's apparent in the image, that's not right either. Right, right, right. So how can a photograph spark just, you know, writing to think about something? And maybe, you know, as teachers, we, you know, can show images and we can give the kids a, a range of possibility of the things that they could do. You know, we can make some suggestions and that they can also collaborate with us. And maybe we will find, I mean, for example, I've got all these pictures I've taken on this last trip and some of the pictures make me think that I'd like to write some nonfiction too. You know, when watching, getting all this, these pictures, it made me kind of get that urge to write nonfiction, which I've never really published nonfiction for kids like that. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sometimes, well, um, please do. Yeah. Well, just like it's, a, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the image should inspire us to kind of want to do some writing about it, but not all the time. There are times I think that you take the picture and the picture stands on its own. You know, what do they say? One picture's worth a thousand words. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, I could see myself sometime this year, you know, invariably I'll be in a middle school this year doing some conferring, a lot of teachers watching and someone will ask a kid to come in that kind of doesn't like to write very much. And, and this year I can imagine saying, you know what, bud, take out your cell phone a second and uh, why don't you just scroll through your Instagram and see if that might work for you to spark some ideas for things you could write about in your notebook. So, you know, there's so many ways that, you know, I think we can imagine this and uh, it's exciting. And then going back to what your, your question earlier about the, the camera's writer's notebook, if you go back to your, to your, you're scrolling through your pictures and you see certain 
themes or certain things that, you know, come back again and again and again, that is probably telling you something that, you yep. know, you're, it's sort of showing you your obsessions or your fascinations. Yep. Yeah. One of the amazing features of your book is, you know, I'm so pleased that we live when we do and a book like yours can be produced. It just includes so many of your gorgeous pictures. And um, to me, that's worth the price of admission right there. The pictures are stunning and they're throughout the book. But, you know, you definitely see themes in the pictures that you share. Definitely your love of the natural world and uh, your love for your grandchildren comes through as well. The other other themes come through as well. But I, I think for kids too, you know, seeing those patterns it's interesting to have that as another strategy, you know, just one way photo, you know, their, their cameras could be used. It's another strategy they could use to spark writing. I think it's exciting to think about. So I've got one more question for you, Ralph. So I'm imagining, you know, your book is going to be out. Everyone's going to have access to it very soon. Or when this podcast is out, it will be accessible to everybody. And I know the teachers are going to read and love this book. And you alluded to this a little bit before, but I'd like you to expand on it. I think some are going to say, but I already have a writing curriculum. It's pretty laid out. And I'm curious about what suggestions you could give teachers like that to begin to integrate what they've learned from your book into their writing curriculums. That's a big question. And um, I think that clearly what Focus Lessons presents is not a writing curriculum. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's just not. It's meant to kind of enrich what teachers are doing. And I think that no matter what genre you're teaching, you're going to be looking at um, certain craft elements. And I really think a lot of those craft elements, by the way, are common. I mean, you know, our friend Tom Newkirk pointed out that, you know, story appears in almost every genre. Right. right? I was making a connection to that when I was reading again today, um, like your craft lesson on foreground and background. When you write history, there's foreground and background. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah. And, and all of these lessons apply, you know, you create tension in nonfiction writing. And, um, and that right. beautiful lesson on creating tension and showing photographs with tension could not just be about story and tension, but in nonfiction or in, 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 in argument writing as well. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. So I think that even those teachers who have a somewhat comprehensive writing program and maybe sequential that it's laid out, I would like to think that there still could be some places where they could interject and intersperse some of these lessons into what they're already doing. And, you know, I think that kids would like that variety of, instead of like looking at text as the mentor, as the mentor, you know, text to look at, looking at the words or the poem or the, uh, at the essay, that they could actually be looking at a visual. The other thing I, I was going to say that I think that as much as we have things to say about these elements of craft with the photos, I think it's also important to leave time for kids to make their own connections to mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, I think that there may be small ways and, and larger ways that we can be, begin to bring in some of the imagery and, but also like the language of the photography into the classroom. And one of the things that I have always believed is that when I go into a classroom, into a school, I do think there's some value in having a common language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't you? Yep. You know, that everybody understands that when you say editing, it doesn't mean revising. Or when you mean, when you say revising, it's not about correcting the spelling. I mean, we can, we can argue about what that language should be, but I think it's important that there's some sort of a common language that everybody, all the teachers understand it. They're on the same page. Parents understand it. The kids understand it. And I think that as we kind of negotiate what that language is, I think that we could include some of the terms from photography that are just clearly applicable to the teaching of writing. Our thanks to Ralph and Carl for their time today. You can follow both of them on Twitter at Fletcher Ralph and at Conferring Carl. Learn more about Focus Lessons at blog.heineman.com. And as always, thanks for listening.